Hello, School Transportation Nation. Welcome back. Great seeing you. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. For all the weeks, we've got 220 episodes under our belt, and this is lucky 221, Ryan. What do you think? 221 episodes. Who knew? Who knew? It uh, doesn't seem like it's that many, but you do the, start doing the math and go back to March of 2020, and there you go, 220. Right on. And guess what? TransFinder has been one of our sponsors since the very beginning, and they're the leader in school bus routing software. We have IC Bus. The next generation can change everything. So we're excited for our sponsors to be here. We're excited for you to be here. And, you know, we're really excited for our own Taylor Ekpatani to be talking to Garage Star Tino Gustafson, Director of Vehicle and Facilities Maintenance for Suffolk Transportation in New York. And that's the Long Island area. And we met Tino uh, last year at STN Expo along with uh, Tommy Smith their uh, chief operating officer. So uh, they're all green awards, doing uh, lots of innovative things in the area of green energy, Ryan. So it'll be interesting to uh, talk to Tino and hear more about what they're doing. All right, before we get to Ryan's headlines, we got a quick message. Hey guys, what do software, hardware, and safety have in common? One word, TransFinder. At the STN Expo in Reno, TransFinder won three Innovation Choice Awards voted on by STN Expo attendees for best software, best hardware, best safety technology. TransFinder's RouteFinder Plus routing solution and apps, StopFinder and WaveFinder are well known in the industry. Not everyone realizes TransFinder provides hardware like card readers, tablets, and mounts. And as for safety, Patrol Finder for schools is TransFinder's latest solution designed to make buses and campuses safer. TransFinder's president and CEO Antonio Civitella said the recognition means so much because it's voted on by STN Expo attendees. Civitella said, we know a lot is riding on TransFinder because a lot is riding on those yellow buses that travel through our communities. TransFinder must continue to innovate as more is being expected of transportation departments from district leadership as well as parents. Learn more at transfinder.com. That's transfinder.com. All right, Ryan, lots happening. Thomas Bill Buses is seeking a new president CEO. Looks like Kevin Bankston, we saw him uh, get promoted into a dual role and now he's officially been promoted, right? All the way through the DTNA family. Yes, well, he's uh, returning to where he started, um, actually, with Daimler Trucks North America on the financial side. So uh, uh, he was actually uh, named the new president and CEO of Daimler Trucks North America Financial Services. So uh, congratulations to him. It uh, wasn't a shock to us uh, when we saw uh, earlier this year uh, that Kevin was uh, tapped to be uh, the CEO of Freightliner Custom Chassis Corporation in addition to uh, uh, retaining his uh, leadership position at Thomas Bill Buses. Um, we figured that uh, um, things would be um, would be changing. We'd be getting new news. And sure enough, uh, Thomas uh, Bill Buses said that uh, they are looking for someone to succeed Kevin. So now Kevin will continue to support both Thomas and Freightliner until his successor is named. Uh, that's what uh, uh, the uh, company told me uh, last week. Uh, but it, it is going to be the third president and CEO in four years. So you might remember that Kevin took over for Kaylee Edgerly uh, back in uh, 2021 when he announced he was leaving for Sunny Merriman, which is one of the, the largest Thomas dealers in the nation there out in Virginia. Um, so uh, they are uh, going to be tapping someone once again. And uh, if history holds, it, it likely will be someone, uh, not necessarily, but uh, uh, could be someone from the Daimler family. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. Also, I saw a couple of weeks ago, Thomas had dropped uh, some images of their brand new safety liner HDX2. And I know Kevin had come out recently and made some comments to the effect of some new products that Thomas is going to be launching in 2025. So we'll, uh, 
hold on to our hats and see what mm-hmm. Thomas has got in their bag of tricks. But it sounds like the new uh, safety liner is going to be constructed in that C2 plant and they're uh, modifying it. Uh, the images look cool. Definitely a, a shakeup for a type D product. I know there, there is demand out there for D. C still reigns supreme. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see some of the new technologies that come out here from, uh, from Thomas Build and Daimler Truck North America. Absolutely. That's going to be the, the first uh, new type D in quite a while for the industry, um, at least from the, 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 the traditional folks. Now, of course, we've seen a lot come to uh, fruition on the, on the electric side from new entrants into the market. Um, but from the, the big three, if you will, um, you know, one, one of the, uh, the, the newer um, aspects from a, from a type D transit style. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, with that, uh, that C2, so actually what they're going to be doing is they're going to be consolidating the the manufacturing of the hdx2 um and uh the, the c2 safety liner um so uh, uh that's going to be increasing production capacity um asked about costs i think you know in the long term that's what they're looking for there's gonna you know we've been talking a lot about the increases in, in school bus prices um you know those are still with us um but certainly, you know, they're they're looking at some streamlined service and maintenance for for that product. So, uh, uh, and you mentioned the the other new products coming. Um, I think we should expect to see a, a gasoline uh, offering from Thomas. In fact, Kevin Bankston made that comment recently, uh, publicly. Uh, so uh, we know that Cummins is working on. Uh, it's uh, octane or gasoline version of its agnostic uh, engine, which you can uh, switch out the fuel heads. Uh, so will that uh, be what will be powering this new uh, Thomas uh, gasoline uh, bus, which, you know, again, maybe maybe next year. And then we've heard that Cummins has said, hey, they're going to go into production with that engine in late 25 full production in 26. So uh, certainly uh, will be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Uh, of course, uh, Daimler and, and Thomas have their own proprietary diesel engine, Detroit diesel. Uh, you know, we're, we'll see how that um, continues to uh, come about uh, from what we're hearing. That's going to continue. Now, all of the diesel manufacturers, Cummins, you know, operates or, or owns the lion's share in terms of market uh, for diesel and school buses. But we heard from Cummins um, and had have heard chatter from from uh, the Detroit diesel side that um, those uh, those diesel engines are going to be continuing on. But certainly, what we're going to be seeing is that um, constrict uh, OEMs are really going to have to decide where they offer their diesel products going forward as we get closer to 2027, and we have the EPA Phase Three GHG rule going into effect. Uh, certainly, there are states where diesel is a non-starter. California and the nearly a dozen states that follow uh, that California Air Resources Board omnibus rule and for school buses uh, that's going towards zero emission. New York, um, there's pockets you know around the country, Maryland, other places that have said you know they've made it a commitment, whether it be regulatory wise, legislative, or just a you know um, a, 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 an understanding that they're going to go zero emissions. So um, you know definitely uh, as things come into focus, uh, it will be interesting to see where those diesel buses and gasoline buses um, you know end up going. And I caught up with Britton Smith, uh, president at Bluebird at STN Expo last month, and they were awarded $80 million from the Department of Energy for a upgraded facility, new facility. And he had said that they're going to build a brand new modernized factory for the Type D manufacturing mm-hmm. specifically. So again, more Type D action. Um, I would surmise just based on that, we might see some newer type D products down the pipeline from Bluebird as well. They have not made any announcements to that effect, but um, you know, when you get an $80 million grant from the federal government to build a new factory, there's definitely going to be a lot of excitement 
and their camp Mm -hmm. about being able to level up their manufacturing game. So we'll have to see what happens, Ryan. It's going to get pretty sporty here. It looks like in 2025. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and that's electric, right? So that's, that's what that grant, um, uh, drives. Cummins got another, you know, has got a grant of 75 million for on this accelerator side to beef up manufacturing. So yeah, certainly we're going to see more type D's. I think that I mentioned earlier with the new entrance in the market with some of those type D's, uh, you know, there are, um, some challenges with those, uh, in, in different states in terms of specifications. I know that, um, the height, of the buses, um, for one, um, in, in certain States like California, uh, for example. Uh, but, uh, I, I think certainly that has shaken up the industry. And I think the other OEMs are saying, Hey, you know, we need to update our products, especially as we're moving into the zero emissions world. Uh, so it, it's time for a refresh. Absolutely. Guys, if you haven't checked it out too, go look at our recent August issue. It's talking about fleet, fleet management, parts, maintenance professionals, garage stars. It's a great read this month. If you go over to the STN website, stnonline.com, you can check that out. Great stories written by Ryan Taylor, our entire team. Uh, really uh, insightful stuff. I know we broke it down last episode, but uh, definitely worth a look if you guys haven't gone on. And uh, also wanted to mention our TSD conference that is down in Dallas, Texas. If you guys have anything to do with special needs transportation, this is the ultimate in special needs training, hands-on, very exciting stuff. We're talking about legal precedents, dealing with students with disabilities, uh, various ends of the spectrum. We've got great keynotes lined up to talk about lots of things happening in the special needs world. We have our super early bird discount to save $200 going on in August, but it will not last long. Go to tsdconference.com to get registered today. Make sure you secure your hotel room as well. We always sell out and everybody wants to stay in the host hotel. So uh, no reason to drag your feet, take advantage of the discount, save yourself a few bucks and come out and visit us in Dallas Frisco here, November 7th through the 12th. We we'll excited to see you. All right, Ryan, let's uh, dive a few more headlines. What else is happening in the world of school transportation? Well, uh, sticking on the uh, electric school bus uh, topic. At the end of uh, 2023, the EPA investigator general came out with a couple of reports um, that uh, looked at uh, preventing fraud, waste, and abuse within the EPA's clean school bus program. That was dropped right before the beginning of the year and highlighted a lot of things that we already knew. We reported uh, on it at the time. I remember, Tony, you and I spoke about it on the podcast um, you know, in the first round or so of the clean school bus, some districts were getting uh, applications submitted on their behalf and didn't even know. Uh, so uh, that was one of the things that the Auditor General came out with. And the, I know EPA has addressed that in its uh, subsequent funding um, programs that have come out. Well, Last week on Thursday, uh, our friends at the Inspector General's office issued a new report. Uh, The EPA needs to improve internal controls for selecting recipients of clean school bus program funds. Um, So uh, what the uh, uh, Inspector General found was uh, EPA did not have a sufficient internal controls in place to ensure it selected recipients with eligible school buses that met the fuel, weight, and operational status requirements for the existing buses that applicants needed to replace. Um, So part of the um, uh, stipulations with, you know, replacing those vehicles and, and the documentation uh, that is necessary. Uh, The the report also found the EPA did not provide oversight to verify that applicants requesting funds specifically for zero emission school buses have school districts with suitable local conditions for these types of buses. Something we've talked a lot about, Tony, uh, you know, one of the the company lines, if you will, when it comes to electric school buses is that school buses are the ideal candidate for electrification. And I would counter with saying some school buses, it depends on the area. I, I think that is 
a pretty um, uh, widely accepted statement across the industry and across, uh, you know, electric school buses and charging infrastructure and whatnot. Uh, there are certain communities in America, a lot of communities, in fact, where electric school buses just don't make sense, at least yet. Uh, the range always comes top of mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, as this report indicates, uh, the the local conditions, and that can be roads, that can be hills, that can be a lot of different things. And, and granted, you know, the, some folks are making it work, but uh, it's it's definitely not a silver bullet at this point. Um, so the uh, the report uh, points out uh, that um, and why it matters. You know, the report says when the EPA does not follow all requirements, there's an increased risk that the potential for fraud, waste, and abuse exists, um, and that the uh, EPA will not fully achieve program intent, uh, and that the public will perceive the competition as unfair. So, definitely looking at taxpayers. Dollars, you know, um, there's all you know, five billion reasons why uh, this program needs to succeed and needs to be run the right way. Uh, so, a lot of lessons that have been learned and that are being learned uh, by the EPA as well as the school bus industry. Uh, so, you know, we have an, a story on that at stnonline.com. Uh, check it out. Yeah, oversight, definitely important when looking at these sorts of uses of government funds, especially in these organizations, especially when you have uh, other vendors involved as well. So you want to make sure everything's above board and, uh, you know, we want an opportunity for more funding in the future. So we got to prove that the uh, f- this first endeavor was successful, right, Ryan? Absolutely. And, you know, someone told me in Reno, um, they, they summed this electric uh, experience up very well. Uh, and I've mentioned it before that we, what we can't have is the school bus industry and school districts to, to take a black eye if this thing, you know, does not perform as intended. And that's what the, the this audit says. Uh, but um, uh, th- this person told me, hey, you know, in trucking, you know, school bus takes the lead from its trucks, especially when you're looking at Thomas built buses with its Daimler parent. You're looking at IC bus with its Navistar and Trayton Group or, or Volkswagen bus parent. That you know, so much trickles down. We always talk about that. The innovations start with truck, and then they trickle down to school bus. Well, you got to remember that the proving ground for any new technology at the trucking in the trucking industry that's a that's a runway of several years. Uh, school bus doesn't have that. the The pilot testing goes on in real time at districts with kids on these buses. So there, you know, there there's reason for. You know, uh, a, a lot of this uh, th- this hand wringing and and pinpointing on how well these programs are working and how well the technology works. Um, so that's always something to for us to to remember as an industry. And that's a story that you know all you uh, school districts and school bus companies out there that are are operating electric school buses or any technology for that matter to get out there in the, in the, in the community and get that message out there that, you know, Hey, um, you know, so much of this is done, you know, um, this is kind of being forced upon, uh, school districts in a way and that they really have to, you know, do their due diligence as best as possible, but in real time. And they don't have, they don't have the luxury that other industries have to kind of take their time and test things. Um, it's really put on their shoulders immediately. All right, Ryan, what other kind of top headlines we got going on this week? Yeah, well, speaking of uh, electric school buses, again, staying in that lane and with auditors report, Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland, the largest public school district in Maryland, one of the largest in the country, made a lot of news uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, when it signed on with Highland Electric. Uh, That was really uh, Highland's first big splash in the school bus market. And we've seen them really expand um, since then with this electrification as a service, um, where they've really brought the you know, the traditional contractor model and turned it on its ear for this age of zero emissions, where they basically provide the school buses, the electric school buses. They 
do all the charging infrastructure work, we work with the utilities, get everything set up, and the school district essentially contracts with them uh, uh, to use these buses. Uh, similar in, in respect to that traditional contract model, but really taking it to the to the nth degree. Well, an auditor's report came out in Maryland uh, in Montgomery County, and it was pointing to um, misuse of funds potentially by the school district uh, because of late deliveries and some mechanical issues. Uh, so I've reached out to uh, the, the school district, uh, already talked a little bit to Highland. Um, they're being very forthcoming on this and saying, hey, look, you know, everyone is dealing with supply chain issues. Uh, everybody across the nation has um, stories of woe to tell about school bus deliveries that were late or still haven't arrived yet. And, you know, Highland uh, has, has been dealing with the very same thing there in uh, Montgomery County, as, as well as uh, other operations. I mentioned they've really expanded uh, nationwide in, in providing this electrification as a service. But uh, this audit points out that uh, basically every fiscal year so that the this contract 168 million plus over four years over the first four years and there could be an additional contract signed for subsequent years but every uh fiscal year so far going back to fiscal year 2022 there have been uh late receival of uh school buses uh so this initial contract of 326 buses the auditor points out that Montgomery County actually had to acquire 90 diesel buses at a cost of about $14.8 million uh, to uh, extend the lifespan uh, of the existing fleet and to make up for uh, some of these buses that weren't uh, arriving yet. Now, um, Highland tells me that uh, they're getting very close to uh, completing that 326 uh, electric school buses. The previous three fiscal years, 2022 through 2024, Montgomery County now does have all those buses. But uh, certainly, you know, th I, I, there's some things that are, that are not mentioned um, in here in this report that when, when we're talking about this $168 million. It doesn't talk about the charging infrastructure uh, that, that was already put in place that, that, um, is, is part of this contract and that, um, Highland Electric, uh, went ahead and supported, uh, the installation, the service of. So, uh, I've seen news articles about this, you know, Washington Post, uh, you know, different news outlets, uh, doesn't seem to be the full story here. And that's of course what we're trying to get uh, here at school transportation news. So, uh, should have an article up uh, that you can check out at stnonline.com. Yeah, it's very interesting, Ryan. I think whenever you look at Montgomery County, you know, what Highland did, it really redefined kind of a, a new business model in the market. And now we've even seen guys like Bluebird come out with Generate Capital. And now mm -hmm. they're offering that same service right at the OEM level, because I think what this does is it disrupts the traditional dealer model significantly. And we've also seen a lot of the newer manufacturers say like somebody like ride byd right they don't have a dealer network that's traditional unless the state requires you to sell through a dealer so it's interesting to see what happens in that world i know we saw some news from lion electric where their earnings came out there really wasn't a lot there with respect to growth from 23 to 24 and they really talked more about trucking than they did school bus and i know that we saw an article in the Chicago Tribune where they laid off 300 people in their uh, Joliet plant, as well as I knew a couple of people at their organization that got laid off. So um, clearly they're doing some cost cutting of labor uh, because sales just wasn't as good as, as they were hoping. And it really, uh, I think, you know, they had a first mover advantage years ago. And now a lot of these companies have all caught up and we've got a lot happening in this EV space, uh, very limited amount of resources going into it. I think everybody was very excited about the trajectory. I don't think it's going to, it's going to stop growing, but maybe it's just not going to grow at the pace 
that people were expecting. And I mean, obviously there's funding from the federal government and the state government that's going to continue to buoy this until what, 2026. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what happens with the presidential election. As you talked about in your August issue article, there's going to be big ramifications, which way the pendulum swings here. So, so I'm very curious to see how this is going to impact the industry. I think competition's a good thing. I hope Lion comes out of this and they're able to survive what's happening, but they've made a huge investment in that Joliet plant. Uh, from my understanding, not a lot of vehicles are being produced out of that plant. And if you got a million square foot plant not producing vehicles, that's not a good sign. So mm -hmm. um, it's very curious to me how this is going to play out. Yeah, and, and uh, I noted uh, that also too that uh, Lion also is um, publicly uh, looking to lease out some of its facility space there in Joliet. So, yeah, that's that's um, um, a, a tricky situation. And I think you know you're you're right. Competition is good, um, but competition also tends to reset the market and you know um it uh certain certain companies will shine um while others uh, don't um and it will be interesting to just see how this thing progresses uh that was a, a comment that was made uh we had a uh pathway to 2030 uh panel um with OEMs in Reno uh, a couple weeks ago a few weeks ago and that was one of the comments was hey you know when you're talking about price you know, you're talking about all of these pressures. Competition is going to play a very big role in that, in in uh, um, both. You know what the the cost is going to be going forward. Everyone, of course, is is asking for it to come down. Uh, Tim Shannon, our friend, formerly the director of transportation and facilities at Twin Rivers Unified in, in uh, Sacramento, California. Um, he was one of those early adopters of this new generation of electric school buses, the factory built um, Lion again, like you mentioned, was really the, the first on the scene. Uh, he is now at Highland. He's retired. Uh, he's they're managing their business development now uh, for Highland. And he at, he raised his question and said, hey, when are prices going to come down? We've been talking, we've been hearing about batteries are getting cheaper and they are. Um, and the supply chain issues, but everybody's saying that it's getting better. When are we going to actually see it come down? And that was one of the answers was like, well, hey, competition is going to rear its head here um, very shortly. And I mentioned this, I believe, last week in our podcast, Tony. Uh, what no one talked about was uh, the EPA Clean School Bus Program. And uh, again, it's no secret that electric school buses to date have – Virtually all of them have been funded by grant money, whether it be state money, Volkswagen money that went through the states, clean school bus, uh, DERA, um, you know, take your pick uh, on the grant program. Uh, but really, you know, federal, uh, state, um, some private funds are really what's holding up electric school buses right now and holding them up, I mean, in terms of getting them out there and, and getting these, these orders. It will be interesting to see, um, again, what happens with the election, um, what happens with the, the clean school bus program and funding going forward. Uh, and um, you mentioned potentially, you know, the, things are slowing down. Um, what kind of slowdown will we see if these funds dry up? So a lot to uh, stay focused on for this industry. Yeah, excellent headlines, Ryan. All right, before we get to our guest interview with Taylor Ekbatani, we have a message for you. Today's tech tip is brought to you by IC Bus. The next generation can change everything. Looking for ways to improve your on-time performance and reduce operating costs? All IC Bus CE Series school buses come standard with factory installed telematics devices, including a five year connectivity subscription. Customers gain access to on command connection, an industry leading remote diagnostic solution, providing data that is visible and easy to understand and actionable. With OCC, your district will have visibility to vehicle health and performance data at your fingertips, including EV specific information like state of charge and estimated range. Learn more about standard capabilities of their connected vehicles at icbus.com. That's icbus.com. 
Good morning or afternoon, Nation. This is Taylor Ekbatani here. It's great to be on for another episode. I have a special guest with us, Tino Gustavuson. He is the Director of Vehicle and Facilities Maintenance for Suffolk Transportation Services in New York. So welcome, Tino. Great to have you on the podcast. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for having me. We're recording it early for PST time, so we're going with morning. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So Tino was recognized this year as a 2024 Garage Star. So the August issue is officially out today as we're recording this interview. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, definitely take some time. Look at this year's Garage Stars. Tino is one of them. And I think you got started in the industry probably the youngest out of all the Garage Stars that we talked to this year. Yes, I started at the age of 15. Uh, it used to, uh, after school, come to this uh, location at Suffolk Transportation, and I used to clean the shops at night, sweep it, uh, dump the garbage and all those. And that's where I got my career started here. What kind of interest you, right? Because you're 15 years old. How do you know about Suffolk? So I had some family members that were working in the shop and I was in school and looking for some extra money. So I asked them to see if they needed any help from any kid that can use his, uh, you know, at school used to get work status forms and you'd fill it out and ask them if, you know, any jobs, whether it was delivering newspapers or anything you could do as a young kid trying to make a few dollars. And they did, they hired me. They had to fill out forms like with my school to allow you to do this. And I would come at night and, uh, and do this, you know, for a few hours every night. And now I think it's what, 35 years later, you said you yes. <laughs> Quite a while. <laughs> you're leading three locations, 11 supervisors, 65 mechanics, three wash bays, eight fuel stations. You have a lot on your hands. A lot since then. Yes. It's uh, a lot of gone through a lot of phases of my career to get to where I'm at now, but yes, being in charge of all our facilities, all our vehicles and all the people that uh, help make this happen. Um, so, but yes, it's a lot on our plate, but enjoy every minute of it. How did it progress, you know, from sweeping shops to now, you know, being the director of vehicle and facilities maintenance? So I started out obviously as cleaning that as a young kid. And then from there, uh, I've always was a mechanic at heart working in my backyard while I was in school, BOCES, learning how to be a mechanic. And then I was able to transition over to being a mechanic here, working on school vans and school buses. From there, I went from so one of the lower class, class three mechanic, and became a lead mechanic on the floor as one of the lead guys working with everybody, whatever I've learned, turning and teaching to others. Um, then became a supervisor. So we have supervisors for each location. So I have a supervisor of the van department, um, working with the mechanics and, you know, being a supervisor and running a whole shop of mechanics. And at that point it might've only been, you know, my department had 400 buses, you know, that was what I was responsible for and maybe 11 mechanics. So that's where it started. Progressed from there to, uh, I became the purchasing director for the company. Um, so I ran all the parts department, the fuel, you know, we have uh, the seven fuel sites that we have. So I ran all the fuel, making sure we purchase it right under all the school districts and a lot of that stuff, plus purchasing for the whole company and all three of our sites to make sure that we were getting proper inventories, best pricing, uh, vendor shopping, you know, whether we did it through bid or just shopping the prices and, you know, giving people our uh, – you know, what kind of purchase we had. I did that for uh, probably another six or seven years. I was doing that part of the job. Um, and then I got promoted to director of vehicle facilities, which I took over all the shops and we have 2,100 buses now and, you know, all these people working. So that's where I is. And then since then we've added, you know, director of uh, facilities, which we have 62 acres of property and over 28 buildings, you know, parking lots. And uh, so I have people that run those departments for me, but I oversee to make sure that we keep that stuff within budget, which was part of my thing is learning how to budget when the parts. Now I transition that over into that part of the company as well. So oh. uh, lots of hats that we call here to, to run it, but uh, uh, a lot to do, but I still enjoy every minute of it. Yeah, that's great. What, cause you've obviously been there the whole time, right? So working yes. through college or school, um, you were still at Suffolk, the, the company. So what kept you 
doing, you know, that job? What kept you at the company for all those years or all these years? It's a great company that always treated you like family. So I watch as we've grown from a smaller company and as we progressed and grown throughout all these years, the company always treated you uh, like family. And I love that about it. So yes, you still have work to do. We all have responsibilities to do jobs. And I love doing what I did. I love being a mechanic at the time and always challenging myself to do more. I, I didn't want to just, you know, I didn't want to be a, just a mechanic. I wanted to be the lead mechanic. And then from there, I wanted to be a supervisor. And then I wanted to run the company. I wanted to be able to, you know, it's, that's what I want to do. And throughout that, they've always helped uh, promote us to do that from within. And at the same time, they, you know, as a company as with over 3000 employees, like we are, we still, everybody is treated like family, you know, I and love that. I, that, that's the part you love about it. You go to work and you could do your job in a company that's big and feel that everybody is feel. So I, and that's how I feel. So I could actually turn that down to the people that I'm in charge of now. It's, it's make everybody feel uh, like they're part of a family. I love that. And so would that be your favorite part of the job or is there something else that stands out as, you know, why you come to work every day? No, I just love every part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I will guess that that is the favorite part because mm-hmm. you come to work and you see people that go to work and just like, oh, I got to go to work. I go to work happy every day because I love what I do and I love going to a company where everybody else does. So it's it, that promoting the way that we do that is is, is a great and then, you know, that's why I, I work with a company with people with 45 years. I got people with a lot more years even than me here. So, <laughs> we, you know, a company this, we, people do stick around for a long time because of, of those qualities. Mm-hmm. And then also you guys are moving forward with EVs. And I think you were one of the first in New York to adopt an EV. We were the first in New York. So, and actually we've even started well before EVs were there. We started in 2008. Well, before they were even talking about EVs, uh, you know, I mean, they were talking about EVs, but it wasn't anything that any you know, laws came out, none of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It was there. And we started working with some engineers. I was still a mechanic actually on the floor and I was helped building these on the floor. Some hybrids we built where we put electric drive motors in. We tried building these, you know, like hybrid assist buses and we utilized that information to give to the manufacturers to help design some of the buses that are out now. And then we were one of the first ones back in 2018 that got some of the first grant money to purchase four full electric school buses, you know, utilize that data to prove what worked, what didn't, you know, and yes, there's bumps and grinds to doing it, but it was as part of what I love doing is, is figuring out how to make these better, how to go back to the manufacturer, what we do. So we did that. Um, and then in 2022, we, uh, transitioned from there to 11, uh, the next generations, uh, changed the whole infrastructure again, which I was part of figuring out building the infrastructure where we have now, we have 11 full electric school buses. Um, and we'll be transitioning into our next phase, which is generation three is we have four more that will be coming within the next year that we have some more grants that we're doing, um, and seeing how they work and getting them to the, where they are. They're not all there yet. And, but they're progressing. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and it, I've been on a lot of webinars and stuff there promoting it to um, take the fear out of people that, yes, it is something new. Yes, it is something that needs more work to get us to where we are, but it'll get there. And we like being the leaders. So that's, you know, we are, I think, one of for New York, one of the largest school bus companies that have it at this point. I know there's a lot more growing, um, but we were one of the first. Yeah, New York has an interesting case where you guys kind of have that mandate. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, so by 2027, you can't pu- purchase another combustion engine. You do have to if buy it. And by 2035, the fleet has to be all electric. So we are moving there um, and we will do whatever it needs to get to that point. Um, but these are huge steps to finding out what works, what doesn't, so we can figure out infrastructures, charging, how they work, reliability, what it takes for mechanics. I have mechanics now getting trained on EVs. And even though a lot of it's still under warranty and the manufacturers are handling a lot of the high voltage side, we're getting familiar, we're getting training and learning. So, and all my techs, you know, hopefully as we transition to this next phase. Mm -hmm. Expanding on that a little bit more, how has maintenance changed with the EVs? So it's still a little early because obviously there did not a lot of mileage on them and there's not mm-hmm. a lot to do. 
But a lot of the normal things that we did on school buses all these years, the brakes are the same, all the lighting inside the bus, seating, all that stuff that you look at on the outside of the bus hasn't changed. So all these texts that are saying, oh, I'm going to lose my job or I can't do it. No, there's no fear because a lot of that is still be the same. The difference is, is the end, you know, where you have a, a diesel engine. Now you have an electric drive motor and some batteries. So there will be more to learn. But all these buses, even on the diesels now, have all kinds of computers on them. So a lot of these techs are learning that. And it's it'll be a lot less costly, mm-hmm. I believe, you know, because of the way they have regenerative braking. You won't have as much brakes to purchase, uh, possibly saving on tires because it'll be a more even stopping with the, you know, with that system. So a lot of that stuff, I believe, there. And there's a lot less parts. A lot less things to go bad compared to a diesel. Mm-hmm. That's where I see this all going. Okay. And you said that you're training your mechanics now. So is that, I know there's different levels to EV maintenance training. So are you kind of starting level one? Yeah. So at this point, I have taken a few of our techs down to Georgia. I've actually even went down there myself to do some classes with our manufacturer, our, our electric, which is Bluebird and Cummins as they're, they're charging on those buses and the drive. So we've gone down there and we've done you know, the first stage of training with them. We are in the process of doing the next stage of training and trying to get our guys certified. It will take us probably a year or so before we can get a few of them. And then once we see how that progresses, we send more techs. We're actually also setting up, we have our own classroom and separate building that has a shop with a classroom off to it so that we can do all our own training where I could bring in the manufacturers to do training in-house. So, uh, which is like a nice 40 seat classroom to be able to do nice small little on-site training for our techs. Yeah. Okay. And then talking about infrastructure, so you're getting more buses, you know, are you guys set up for the infrastructure for, would that be 15 buses? Yes. So our infrastructure is already set. I have two sites right now with 11 DC fast chargers with 60 KW chargers on them. They're also V to G, they vehicle to grid, so they can charge back. Um, so that was one of ours. We have room to expand on that for our sites. I also have a lot of data based on what it takes to charge them now to what it'll take to charge. And where everybody was feared that we're going to need so much more electric than air, we're starting to see that maybe it's not as much needed because with a 60 kW charger on these buses, with our routes, the way we set them up, they're only 50 to 60 mile runs. So with that, we could charge them every other day as these batteries get a little longer. And one charger, 60 kW fast charger on these, can charge a bus in under two hours. Wow. So if you can get one charge, you could do four or five buses a night. So you, and then one 2,500 amp service can handle about 20, uh, 30 of those charges, 30 to 33 three charges per system. So if you could do five, one smaller system can handle almost 150 buses where they thought they'd need a lot of more. So we've actually, with all the data we've gained, has helped us realize that we can do it a lot more efficient and maybe save a lot of costs on infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Okay. And are you guys looking at above ground infrastructure at all? So all of our chargers, yes, is all, you know, so it is above ground. It's oh, okay. all, all the, the electric's underground, but it's from where our transformer is from our poles there. Uh, all, most of Long Island's electric is above ground. So they have all above ground poles. But from there, once it hits our site, then the rest of it's underground. Gotcha. We try to save. And then we're working with these chargers and the manufacturers to see if like maybe one charger with our management program can like sequentially charge them. So you could use maybe one charger to save a cost of, say, of 60000 for a charger. Maybe that works and can do five buses uh, on one charger and maybe make it sequentially charged. So you can pull five buses up. One charger plugs in five and it sequentially charges them. So these are some of the things we're working on to see how the infrastructure can uh, progress. Yeah, it really sounds like you guys are diving in to realize the cost savings and not spend so much on infrastructure. And that's yeah, exactly <laughs> what we're working on. It, yes, because if you have to do it at, at that cost, it is very costly. So we're working on all the ways to, to hopefully uh make those costs come down. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then another thing we looked at in the August issue that we talked to you about was parts and purchasing program. And you guys actually implemented your own program, I believe. It's not our own. It was a program we bought, which is TMW, um, which is a a private company that we do, but we brought this program in back in 2018. And then 
you know, as you find all the nuances of the program and figure out how it is and get it really working to the best that works for your company, we found that the reporting on this, we could figure out exactly what we use. I could break down a part on a bus based on a year. So if you want to find out certain things are happening, there's so much reporting. There's mins and maxes. There's warranty. It could, it could put every part have how, what the warranty is. So if it goes to add, so if somebody comes and asks for another one for that bus, it'll say, hold on, we put one on a year ago, and that has a two year warranty. Don't it'll. So now I could take that bus, even though it may still be bad. Now we could send it back and get our money back in warranty. Hmm. Where years prior to that, it was just put another one on hmm. and you didn't realize it was warranty. So it was a lot of cost savings and being able to warranty cores, which is a big part of parts. You have to buy a part that has a core charge because they want the old one back to remanufacture it. Um, if you weren't tracking that, getting that money back was a very hard thing. This program tracks all of that. Um, you know, it could tell you your three, six, 12 month usage. So you could determine how much to use, how much to keep on the shelf. It also could tell you that you're using less to maybe start reducing your inventories because maybe the bus is getting older. Maybe you're looking to phase them out and get them, get rid of them. You don't want to keep all that inventory inventory on the shelf because a lot of times if you have it sitting in your inventory a year later you can't get that money back from the manufacturer so if you start to slowly reduce your inventories by the time those buses are phased out and that part's no longer useful you didn't have a lot to throw away mm -hmm. so there's so much this program does to help these inventories and it has reduced I think at this point, we are still have the same budget in inventory budget now that we had back in 2015. Wow. And you have, and we have probably 400 more buses. Okay. So that shows where the, you know, everybody knows where all the increases are at this point to be able to still run at a, at a very efficient cost mm -hmm. programs is what to help do that. Okay. So you can kind of see, oh, I need more of this part in stock, or I don't need as much as this part. Yeah. Has the supply chain impacted that at all? It has. It's, it's getting better. But <laughs> yes, during the pandemic, it was very difficult because supply chain issues was uh, you know, very high. But this program helped us where we can say, hey, I use 100 in a year before these parts start going. You know, you're starting to hear this supply chain issues and mm -hmm. you know maybe they're starting to show it up i know i buy use 100 in a year maybe i need to up my you know maybe i bulk purchase mm -hmm. and they buy it um sometimes once they're out then you say okay i don't have anything what can i do so yes the program helped us to do it and um being able to have multiple vendors so i was able to see through our program where we can purchase maybe it's on an aftermarket so our program did help with that you know, still never perfect because sometimes you find out after there's no more, you know, or they are supply chain issues, but it definitely helped us keep uh, vehicles on the road. Okay. Yeah. In our survey, when we asked um, transportation department, you know, how much they're spending on certain aspects of the garage, one of the things was, I think it was almost a hundred thousand dollars on, on parts. And that seems like a lot to be spending throughout the year, but m maybe having some sort of technology to monitor that helps. Oh, it definitely helps because right now I could actually, with these programs, I could run an average cost by year of vehicle and see how your cost increase. So I have programs with this program. I can run, let's just say a large bus Bluebird. I can run from a 2012 all the way up to a 2024 and see what the average cost. So say I have a hundred and we spend a hundred thousand on parts for a 2013. I can break that divided by the amount we have and get an average cost. And I can do that across every year run that report and say, hey, in 2024, it cost me $700 a year to run that bus. In 2013, it cost me 5000 or more. So you can make those determinations and say, hey, maybe the savings you know, on a bus, I could buy, maybe I, I replace them at 12 years instead of 13 or go 11 because the cost drastically grows and you could depreciate the bus or, and you could utilize all that data to determine how to buy, purchase and keep. Or maybe you find out that that particular bus runs really well and maybe keep it for a few more years and utilize the savings that you're not spending. So it's a lot of this program helps with that to mm -hmm. beat those costs down. And that's part of what we do. OK, wow. So you guys are seeing then a cost savings. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, definitely cost savings. Buses are built better. Vehicles are built better than they were years ago. So you do see that as well. So I don't want to say it's just a program and what we do, <laughs> although I'll take credit. It, it's, it's a combination of everything. But 
you also can utilize a program to look at particular vehicles that work better than others to see because there's different manufacturers of school buses so if you have a few different times maybe you see maybe we buy more of those because they operate better so there's so much that you utilize from this Mm -hmm. awesome well i really appreciate you jumping on tino is there any lasting advice you want to share with our listeners um, in terms of running a facility or implementing evs don't be afraid of it so my biggest thing is don't be afraid of evs as much as there's so much to learn with it um start planning so the biggest thing is if you're thinking about it, figure out your runs, how long, so you can determine out the bus and the batteries, what size of a bus you need, or what size battery in an EV, and what size chargers and infrastructure you need. Uh, work with your power authorities because it does take time to get that all put into place. So you got to figure you're going to be 12 months to 24 months to get this all set up. So plan now and figure it. The more information you get, the better you'll be. Great. Well, thanks so much again for jumping on and congrats on a, being a 2024 Garage Star. You'll get free main conference registration to one of our shows for 2025. So hopefully we'll see you in person next year. Sounds good. Thank you. A special thanks to Taylor Ekbertani, Tino Gustafson, and Mr. Ryan Gray for always insightful commentary. Uh, guys, hope you appreciated all the great insights on this episode. We appreciate our sponsors, Transfinder and IC Bus. Guys, make sure you catch up on all the latest news, analysis, the latest magazines, scnonline.com. Also, don't forget, register for that TSD conference. Save with the super early bird registration November 7th through the 12th everything you need in the special needs training hands on ride and drives technology experiences we got it all down in Dallas Texas so make sure and join us tseconference.com to get set up take a look at that agenda see what we've got in store for you don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts Spotify wherever you listen to pods to catch up on every weekly episode of the School Transportation Nation Guys, we love you. We'll see you next week.